Radar is a fantastic technology. Without it, we would not be able to fly safely around the world. Today we will explore another usage of this technology. We will build a radar speed gun. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with a Swiss accent, with a new episode around sensors and microcontrollers. But first I have to show you my new arrival. A few days ago I got a packet from DHL, this time not from China. It was from Keysight, a large manufacturer of measuring equipment with great roots. The grandfather of Keysight was Hewlett Packard and the mother Agilent. Keysight, as one of the first electronic manufacturers, has a strategy to support makers. And because I wanted an oscilloscope with four channels, we found a way which was affordable for me. But they offer even more for us. As every year in March, during their WAVE weeks, they give away free equipment and tips without strings attached. Last year, Dave Jones made it public and I participated but unfortunately did not win. Maybe this year I'm luckier. Anyway, I encourage you to join. During 12 days, they give away dream bundles which are absolutely not affordable for the normal maker. You find a link in the description. And please report back if you won. But now back to our radar sensors. In video number 135 I tested simple radar sensors which can detect the presence of things. After this episode some viewers asked if it is possible to measure also speed with the sensors tested in the video. My answer was no. Today we will use a more advanced bunch of sensors and try to build this thing, which, in the wrong hands, can cost us a lot of money. I think we all know which hands I'm talking about. I was already fascinated by the simple detectors, and I am even more intrigued by the new ones. They use the Doppler effect to measure speed. The Doppler effect uses the fact that waves reflected by moving parts have a slightly different frequency. As we know from the cars of the owners of radar speed guns or ambulances. The tone of their sirens change when they pass us. These frequency changes are very, very small. Only 0.000001% of the frequency sent to the object. Which is why we have to use very high frequencies. I have here two sensors, the cheaper but bigger HB100 and the small CDM324. The first runs on 10 GHz and the second on 24 GHz. These are incredibly high frequencies. Common sense would assume we need exact and expensive devices to detect such small changes. Maybe this is the reason for the high prices of speeding tickets? Fortunately we can use a trick. If we mix two frequencies, we get the sum and the difference of both frequencies as an output. Let's assume the signal reflected from the car is 100 Hz higher because of the Doppler effect. Then we mix the signal sent to the car at precisely 10 GHz with the reflected one at 10 GHz plus 100 Hz. According to what I said before, we get two frequencies at the output of the mixer. 20 GHz plus 100 Hz and 100 Hz. We are not interested in the 20 GHz signal because I have no means to measure it. The 100 Hz signal however sounds much more interesting because this is in the range of cheap operational amplifiers. One problem solved. But what about the frequency stability? What happens if the frequency of our oscillator is not stable? We have to assume that our signal is not very stable because we cannot afford expensive oscillators. What happens to our formula? Let's think we have a lousy stability and our device emits a signal of only 9.9 .9 GHz. What happens? Because the change is applied to both the sending and the returning signal, we still get our 100 Hz difference. Also, this problem is solved without high cost. Do you understand now why I am fascinated by these devices? 
summarize, we do not need a stable transmitter nor expensive amplifiers to measure 10 GHz signals. We need simple technology to deal with signals of a few hundred hertz. This is why these sensors do not cost an arm and a leg. The 10 GHz version costs $2.5 and the 24 GHz version around $6. By the way, their main usage is movement detectors in automatic doors. If we open the 24 GHz device, it looks like magic. Most of the passive parts are etched onto the copper of the PCB and we only find one active element. For these high frequencies, small structures like the one here on the PCB behave like capacitors or inductors. If you are interested in this kind of things, you might be interested in the signal path channel. But remember, this is hardcore. On the other side of the PCB, we find the antennas. One is to transmit and the other one for receiving the signal. The HP100 looks similar. Its structures are bigger because the wavelength of 10 GHz is also longer. And it has a small detail. Below this QC sticker, we find a small screw. I assume this screw is part of a capacitor and used to adjust the frequency. If one of you wins the RF bundle of Keysight, he can tell us if I'm right. He then can measure frequencies up to 26.5 GHz. Looking at the block diagram of the HB100, we see the oscillator which produces a stable frequency. Its signal is divided into two parts. One part goes to the transmitting antenna, the other, smaller portion, to the mixer. The receiving signal is fed directly to the mixer. The resulting signal is connected to the output pin. Let's now look at the output signal, of course with my new oscilloscope. To get a good signal we place the sensor upwards and move metal in front of it. As expected, we see a wave of about 400 mV peak to peak. The amplitude as well as the frequency is variable. From before we know that only the frequency contains the information we need. But how do we measure frequency? A simple way is to measure the time between two zero crossings of the wave. In our case, this is around 15 milliseconds, which would result in a frequency of about 70 Hz. But with modern oscilloscopes, we also can use a built-in function called Fast Fourier Transformation, or FFT. It displays the frequency contained in a wave in a second chart on the same display. Let's check. The yellow curve is the input signal and the white curve displays the frequencies contained in this signal. The peak of the white curve is around 70 Hz as expected. Because our movement was not very smooth, we have more than one frequency included. And because we limited the spectrum display to 500 Hz maximum, we do not see the small high frequency parts of the curve. Now the question, how fast did the metal move at this moment? The formula is for kilometers per hour. Speed equals frequency divided by 44. And speed equals frequency divided by 69 if you want the result in miles per hour. So at this moment our metal piece moved 1.5 kilometers per hour because we look at the curve which was produced when the metal was close to the stop. We know this because the reflected energy is high and the amplitude is big. If we move back towards the beginning of the movement, the amplitude gets smaller but the frequency gets higher. As a maximum, we find about 250 Hz, which is 6 km per hour. Pay attention, this calculation is only valid for the CDM324 module, which operates on 24 GHz. The HP100 on 10 GHz would produce a smaller frequency. You find a link in the description if you want to make your own calculations. Cool! Now we have to amplify the signal and make it audible. For that, we use an amplifier out of my drawer. It uses a simple LM386 chip and we can connect a small loudspeaker to its output. Now we can hear speed. The higher the frequency, the faster the movement. 
if we connect the oscilloscope to the output of the amplifier, we see that the signal is amplified and sometimes clipped if the metal is close enough to the sensor. Now we are ready for a first field test. We take our sensor to the outside. And then it is also time to disclose the purpose of this endeavor. We mounted the sensor on the camera and you should hear the sound coming out of the loudspeaker. And again you see that the creator of this video does not spare any effort for a good video. I am the driver of the speeding vehicle. My assistant, Marvin, acts as a police officer. As you see, his dress code today is undercover. You clearly hear the movement of the bicycle when I drive by and the signal is already picked up from quite far away. Do you recognize the difference between a fast and a slow movement? But why do I use my bicycle? Cars are much easier to detect as you hear here. What do we want to build? We want to make a cheapo bicycle counter. These days, many cities want to know the number of bicycles driving on particular roads into the town and back. The currently used devices are quite expensive, their mounting is not easy and they are quite bulky. Our device, of course, will also use LoRaWAN to transmit the measured results back to the office. But wait, did I say into the city and back? Do we have to detect also the direction of the movement? Yes, of course. But did you see any difference in the signal when the metal moved to or from the sensor? No. The frequency was the same if the metal moved towards or from the sensor. So no directional information. One thing can help us probably. These devices are very directional. If we look at the case of the CDM324, we find unknown material which most likely is used to shield the rays. Let's now listen very carefully to the signature of the tone produced by my bicycle. If I move towards the center and if I drive away from it. Do you hear the difference? You are right. If I approach the sensor, the frequency gets lower when I'm very close. And in the other way, the frequency starts low and gets higher. If we could detect this change, we also could sense the direction. The guys who still remember trigonometry from school know the reason for this frequency change. We can also buy similar sensors which can detect direction. They have two mixers which use signals which are 90 degrees out of phase. They are not available on AliExpress and more expensive. But I ordered one for the next part of this video. What did we discover so far? That we can measure speed with cheap radar sensors. We only have to amplify the output of the sensors to get a usable signal. But apparently not too much, otherwise it starts to clip. The sensor was able to detect a bicycle over a distance of about 20 meters. Maybe we can increase its reach if we can raise amplification. The sensors we use are not able to detect direction. Perhaps the one which is on order can do it. If we were able to calculate the frequency of the output signal, we would get the momentary speed of a bicycle, not only its presence. And if we would be able to detect a falling or rising frequency, we even could identify the direction of the movement. We found two ways of translating a signal from the so-called time domain into the frequency domain. By measuring the time between two crossings and by applying a fast Fourier transformation to the signal. The advantage of the first method is simplicity. The power of the latter is that it should be able to detect more than one frequency in a signal. With the ESP32 we have a fast processor and maybe we can use the Arduino FFT library to measure the frequencies contained in the signal. And we have to work on an amplifier for the sensor. Perhaps we even have to try one with automatic gain control to get a more stable amplitude. All this is stuff for another video. Stay tuned. In the meantime I will use my bike as much as possible to be able to speed for our future tests. 
I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.